This is FX Radio and I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook and I'm here at the 2015 Bioceutical Symposium with Dr David Harsey. Welcome David. Very nice to be here. Huh? David, tell me a little bit about your history because you do some really exciting things um, and, and what attracted you to in, embrace complementary medicine or hmm. integrative medicine? Well, thanks for asking. Uh, well, I'm a farm boy by heritage. And uh, farm boys tend to be very practical. And one doesn't want to spend their time doing something that they're going to have to redo later. Yeah. My father always says, you know, do it right the first time or you're going to have to do it again. And uh, he always did follow through in his word on that. And uh, as I engaged in uh, as an allopath, uh, an MD from Vanderbilt, and uh, I found that my practice was the treatment of disease, my job was to diagnose a disease and then treat the disease. And increasingly over the course of the years, I recognized I just was in diagnosing more diseases in the same people repeatedly. And I became frustrated because the whole job I thought of being a physician was to create health. But I didn't have a model for that in, med in medicine at that time. Mm -hmm. I really instead had the opportunity to learn and say, hmm, how can I create health within the scientific guidance of healthcare? So you actively searched out integrative medicine? I did. I didn't. Matter of fact, I did. I was not one of those doctors that had some horrible health condition. I didn't so have cool. this crisis of confidence. Nothing. I just wanted a better way. Mm. And I thought, wow, there's... Oh, well, let me tell you, there was part of it. I uh, was at the Mayo Clinic, mm. uh, practiced there, and I actually started the Evidence-Based Medicine Club uh, for our department. Uh, and this was when Evidence-Based Medicine was just starting out. And I became incredibly disillusioned with the fact that so much of what we do in healthcare didn't actually have any evidence to support it. So I became a bit of a therapeutic nihilist. I was going like, well, why the heck am I wasting my time doing this when science doesn't really support it? And uh, so, but I found other papers as I was going through this, uh, information on CoQ10, information on probiotics, and information on fundamental biochemistry that governed the function of the entire body mm. that didn't seem to be getting any press. It certainly wasn't being taught to me by my mentors, and I began to wonder why. Um, and and why, do you, why do you think that is? Well, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a complex answer, but the simple answer is follow the money. And uh, if you want to understand anything that is, doesn't seem to make sense, why a safe, uh, inexpensive intervention could do a lot of people benefit and it not be known about or used, well, there must not be a lot of money in it. And that ended up to be the case. So, so there wasn't a, if there's not a patent to drive research dollars, then you don't get pat, you don't get papers made. And if you don't get papers published, then the scientific community doesn't know about it and certainly doesn't think it's valid. So it becomes this negative self-reinforcing cycle. Um, money can beget awareness, and without that initial funding, mm, it's hard to hard to do that. Mm. So tell me what you say to your orthodox colleagues when they say, ah, that complementary medicine stuff. How do you answer that? Oh, you know, interestingly enough, I don't get that comment very often. Um, I, uh, I love to engage the specialists I work with. I think it takes all brands of specialists uh, to be able to engage the human condition. Uh, I think human disease and health is incredibly complex, and I want as much help as possible. I'm very glad to have a uh, angle to help people, uh, certainly on the health creation side of it. But I really appreciate the rest of my colleagues in healthcare, and I love to engage them in conversations about how does the underlying function of the human body contribute to them being more successful in their healthcare practice. I love to ask them, you know, well, uh, would you like to look at an article? Because this is really interesting, and I'd like to know your opinion on it. And we start a conversation. And physicians, I have found to be incredibly good souls. You know, they go into this mm. so that they can help people. Mm. And if one isn't uh, arrogant or obnoxious about one's own viewpoints uh, and is open to learning and being wrong, 
you know, I'm very thankful for my colleagues that have shown me uh, that I was incorrect in my beliefs in certain areas. Mm. Um, and so it's a two-way street. I think if one is willing to learn, one is also willing to teach. And um, so I guess I don't get a lot of pushback because I think I approach my colleagues from an angle of always wanting to know more. What do they know that I maybe don't yet? But I think there's a whole lot of information that they, uh, because of just not being made aware yet, um, are not including in the practice of their particular specialties. The overarching paradigm of the 2015 Biocidical Symposium is that there are infinite insults, but there's only really that well, there's finite um, responses, and they are majorly the inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction. Tell me how this fits into neurodegenerative neurodegenerative diseases, where something like immune dysfunction isn't readily apparent. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, if we take a look at uh, Parkinson's disease, for instance. Uh, Parkinson's disease has um, known predecessor activities such as exposure to pesticides. And in in susceptible individuals, that will start an inflammatory process in the striatum niagarum, the areas of the brain that make dopamine. And those cells will start to die. And you won't start getting symptoms of Parkinson's disease until you've used up almost 90% of those neurons in those specialized areas. And at that time, even the very first stages of physical Parkinson's disease should really be considered end-stage Parkinson's disease. And if we want to wrap, go back and say, well, it, what could we do about that? Uh, we can't turn back the clock and say, hmm, let's, uh, you know, let's make sure you never get in contact with that pesticide uh, in the first place, or let's understand what kind of genomic susceptibility you have as opposed to another individual, and is that an appropriate place for you to be? Instead, we can step back and say, hmm, we know there's inflammation and oxidative stress going on in these parts of the brain. Can we shift the health of the body as a whole? Can we influence the immune system by changing the molecules that float through the bloodstream that are perpetuating the inflammation at a level that maybe not need be necessary. So the immune system lives mostly in the gut. 60 to 70 percent of all of our immune cells are there, and those immune cells love to communicate with the rest of the body. And um, if the gut is inflamed as a result of eating foods that are inflammatory or having Um, a large number of gram-negative bacteria that are sneaking across the gut border, causing what we would colloquially call leaky gut syndrome Mm -hmm. and turning on the inflammatory messengers. Um, If those processes are occurring, it's making the immune system as a whole revved up. And that is fanning the flames towards worsening neurologic degeneration. I've been astounded in my own practice to see individuals with Parkinson's disease, notably at early stages is when they respond best to these types of therapies, um, change their diet. We see their inflammatory markers in their bloodstream improve. We uh, are tracking uh, those inflammatory markers and even markers of oxidative stress, the amount of glutathione they make the amount of superoxide dismutase 1 and 2 that they produce, their level of F2 isoprostanes, some very clear markers of oxidation. When we see those improve, then there is symptomatic improvement in that individual and um, a slowing of the progression of this disease. Now, is it stopping the disease? Um, in some individual, I've been surprised that they have not progressed for eight years in following them with this particular strategy. Mm-hmm. But that's the, that's the exception mm-hmm. rather than the rule. Parkinson's, like I said, by the time it first shows forth, is really an end-stage process and requires a very intensive intervention to start slowing down that process. But I was really intrigued by... Um Many people would say, oh, well, you know, of course you're going to see uh, improvements over a slow period of time because it's a self-limiting condition, something, something, and not Parkinson's, but other conditions. But I was quite taken by how dramatically some of your patients respond over a very short period of time given dietary changes. 
the body is a network of networks of networks. And the idea that we intervene in someone's health from a linear standpoint, we, we do a, give an individual a single pill, here's a single drug, and now we expect that single intervention to change a huge system of systems mm. is really rather ludicrous. When one changes what you're eating, uh, you're changing a whole host of biomolecules that are interfacing with the body. When you work with multiple nutritional supplements, when you work with several different modalities such as neurofeedback or transcranial direct current stimulation or, um, or deal with in, uh, individuals on a psychologic standpoint, and you're doing those things simultaneously, mm -hmm. I feel you get synergy you're able to shift the system as a whole. Um, it's a good parallel to even financial systems, right? A financial system is a complex, dynamic system. And if you want to be really tricky and all of a sudden chain, you want that system to be healthier, mm. well, you can't just infuse a whole bunch of money into it. That's going to make the system healthier for a very short period of time, and then everything else in the system is going to adapt around it, and it's probably going to be more unstable in, at the end. Mm. The same way with the body, with a complex system that is the body. Multi-dimensional, iterative, meaning that we, we try something, and we assess the response, and then we adapt and modify that intervention. Those types of approaches uh, are more effective than a single pill, a single modality approach. So and I think that it really that's really the essence, I believe, of integrative medicine, yeah. is that we can nudge the body very gently in multiple different areas and potentially create a response that's much larger than shoving it very hard in one particular area. What other messages do you think are critical for delegates of the 2015 symposium to take away? Mm. <laughs> well, number one, that the body is rational. You know, nature has certain underlying principles by which it governs itself. And the body is designed to heal. The processes of inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction are three common ways the body uh, is responding to a noxious input of some sort. So instead of thinking that the body has broken, no, these are mechanisms by which the body is actually overshooting what is a healing response. Mm. And that overshoot makes uh, what we would call disease when left unchecked for a long period of time. And one, one looks at the body through the lens of function rather than the lens of disease, you have a great number of opportunities to influence function. And um, that's what I'd like people to remember. The brain uses 20% of the energy that we put into our mouths. Surely that's got to increase on a stressful day. <laughs> <laughs> well, one would, one would think. Uh, one would think. I think this is probably a critical uh, reason why we should be concentrating on our diet and make it make sure that it's as healthful as as we could. But do you see dramatic changes when you just change somebody's dietary intake from a poorly um, nourished or nourishing diet to a very healthful diet? Absolutely, we do. Um, one of the technologies we use in our practice is quantitative EEG, and this is a form of brain mapping. We use brain maps to um, not just assess the overlying uh, electrical activity of the brain, but also to monitor uh, when we stress the brain with a task, how fast can that brain respond? And that's measured through something called event-related potentials. So we have objective data that... Um, when in health is improved by changing the diet, you actually change the brain waves that are being made in that particular individual. And so I presented a case uh, here at the symposia of a lovely 40-year-old woman with intense anxiety. And uh, by changing her diet, uh, removing wheat, milk, corn, some of the sensitive foods that upregulated her immune system and were causing documented inflammation through a measurement we call high-sensitive C-reactive protein, 
we got to see uh, not just her thyroid health improve and not just her inflammation blood markers get better, but we also were able to document via quantitative EEG a trend towards normalization of her brain waves. And that was a uh, all accompanied with her dramatic subjective improvement, you know, a lessening of her anxiety and decrease in her joint pain. And all of this happened in the course of approximately three months. So the diet is, you know, 30 tons of molecules that we put in our mouth over the course of our lifetime. It's a huge influencer of our genetic expression. So if we want to change our genetic potential, we must use diet as a, as a significant interface to make that so. So quantitative EEG helps us to understand what type of brain dysfunction may be going on and, if, and showing individuals their brain map and showing them the connection between the location of dysfunction and their actual psychologic dysfunction is incredibly freeing for individuals. So for instance, we see a, a large amount of frontal dysfunction on the quantitative EEG mm -hmm. and to show that yes, this is the area of the brain that controls both attention and mood. Uh, the amount of shame and guilt that can be released from an individual by seeing their brain as just another organ mm -hmm. is really quite amazing. And it's not just that they can let go of shame and guilt when they can see objective data about their brain. They also engage in a higher level of responsibility. It's like, wow, I really have something I get to work on. I have an opportunity to know, to get better. And when they can see the past improvements of other patients um, as a result of changing diet or using neurofeedback or um, the targeted nutritional supplementation or detoxification programs, when they can see those changes happening, uh, it induces hope that induces new action. And action is the solution for uh, new actions are the solution for creating new, well, new outcomes. Mm. You mentioned supplements just before, and it, and it's a very common, uh, you know, approach to include supplement in an integrative medicine approach. So. I'm not going to ask you for your top five. It's too complex. You've been covered ad nauseum in your case histories. But what sort of supplements do you find are just, dare I say the word, universally useful? Are, are there favourites that you go, I very commonly use that, that and that? Sure. Um, number one, supplements, we have to remember, well, what do we call them? We call them supplements. They're supplemental to diet. Yes. They're supplemental. Absolutely. And the idea that you can take a fistful of pills and not change your diet and mm. somehow get a remarkable yeah. health outcome, eh, that's really pushing it. And I think that it's kind of disingenuous to the entire idea. Supplements are, you know, how do we improve upon what should be an excellent diet? Mm. So I really don't recommend supplements until we've engaged diet extensively. Uh, that being said, there's a few nutrients that are pretty remarkable. One of them is CoQ10. And CoQ10 is produced in our body by muscles. So when we exercise and we have higher muscle mass, we will make more CoQ10. CoQ10 is an important molecule I like to think of it as the most important guy in the bucket brigade of passing hot electrons down the chain to allow them to cool off. <laughs> it's, it's basically making the water wheel of energy production inside our cells move forward. Mm -hmm. Without CoQ10, everything starts to slow to a, a, a grind. With CoQ10, we see improvements in energy, improvements in muscle function, and improvements in cellular health in general. A recent paper was published uh, in Europe looking at heart failure mortality and a dramatic decrease in heart failure mortality of nearly 50% uh, improvement was uh, obtained with just CoQ10 supplementation was that over the, the course of a couple of years. Yes, that was a Q-Symbio yeah. trial, yeah. Yeah. correct. And wow, mm. you know, even if the 
even if the replication of that study is a half or a fourth as good, it's still one of the largest advances that we've seen in uh, heart failure treatment to date. And it's safe. There's relatively no individual that cannot take CoQ10. Um, and uh, it, so that's definitely be one of the top on my list. Mm. Uh, anytime I would like to see the body's cellular energy production to be better, I would start with CoQ10. Uh, another one are um, probiotics. And probiotics are healthy bacteria or bacteria that have a healthy relationship with the body at large. Now, they're, to say probiotics, it's, it's not even like saying cars, <laughs> you know, because you have everything from your Lamborghini to uh, great grandpa's, uh, you know, clunker yeah. pickup truck yeah. that's yep. broken down, <laughs> yeah, to a Humvee, to a, you know, massive uh, mining uh, dump truck. You know, they're saying a vehicle is a big term, yeah. the, the, but the variety in probiotics is far more diverse than that. And what we've learned over the course of time is that it matters very much which probiotic you're using for which purpose. There's a thing called strain specificity. It's almost like a license plate number on the back of a supplement bottle that will say exactly what strain of probiotic is present inside that bottle. And that strain has been specifically studied in humans to have a particular benefit. So with probiotics, we can think of them in a big um, uh, in, in, a, in a big way and say that, yes, those are healthy bacteria for us. But it, when we start to apply this in a medical arena and we want to be far more specific with the outcome that we're obtaining, uh, certain strains of probiotic are much more beneficial, uh, are much beneficial to uh, an individual than others. So um, while we can speak in generalities that probiotics are safe and effective, uh, the devil's in the details here. Yeah. And a lot of people can waste their money taking a probiotic that has uh, been exposed to oxygen or been exposed to high heat or maybe just grown in a vat and harvested into a capsule with no real therapeutic benefit. So um, understanding what type of probiotic, how much you're getting and having a high quality probiotic often is critical to the end results that one sees. I was interested about one point that you made in your lecture when you were talking about how after exercise and also under the influence of oxidative stress or increased ox oxidative stress, that tryptophan can cause fatigue. Mm -hmm. What's the relevance here to um, sports performance, for instance? Oh, yeah. So tryptophan is the raw material amino acid that can become serotonin, you know, which we often think of as our happy chemical, mm -hmm. but does a whole lot more in the body. But tryptophan, when it does not become serotonin, has another metabolic fate, and that's to become a set of molecules called kynurinate and quinolinic acid. When we exercise, um, oftentimes the, the amount of tryptophan in the brain will build, and especially if there's oxidative stress or inflammation in the brain, uh, we're going to have a rapid buildup of these metabolites of tryptophan. And they actually signal specific areas in the brain called the anterior cingulate or the medial insula uh, that send messages of central fatigue. Uh, saying to the brain, you are too, you, you're saying to the rest of the brain, you are too tired to go on, or you will soon be so tired you can't go on, so you better slow down. So tryptophan can be a messenger of fatigue. And some individuals have even used tryptophan to aid sleep, you know, to cause fatigue uh, before going to bed. And that's a you know, that's part of the mechanism by which that happens. So this would be an arena where you'd be working with uh, an, an elite athlete, say, mm -hmm. and making sure that their gut dysbiosis and their inflammation and their oxidative stress was under Absolutely. control. To, Absolutely. Absolutely. To you manage know, their fatigue. Yeah, because like I said, it's a system of systems. We want to improve athletic performance. Wow. Well, we've we had, and I work with some highly elite athletes, uh, an individual who's, you know, going for the world championship and senior cycling. And one of our largest 
challenges is keeping his oxidative stress level low and making certain that he metabolically recovers after his intense training. So you can, um, and you do that by making certain the gut is healthy and understanding that his hormone balance has to be excellent, have enough of the hormones that he needs to um, build new tissue, uh, but not so much that he starts building fat. Mm. Um, it's, uh, it's wonderful because modern laboratories give us the ability to measure just about anything. Yeah. Uh, I've got to say, I was, I was so impressed with the, the actual objective data that you, you were presenting in your case histories. Yeah, awesome. yeah. So we have the ability of doing the full metabolome in our clinic. And a metabolome is measuring nearly 1,100 molecules uh, at one time for the individual. And we can see all of metabolic functions function uh, simultaneously, which is a great benefit mm -hmm. because we often get our information piecemeal and therefore we're not really certain how it all interrelates. But if we can measure most everything at the same time, then we can make some much, we make much better conclusions upon the dynamic uh, behavior of the system as a whole. So being able to look at all of the pathways of tryptophan metabolism simultaneously gives us a level of wisdom about what this individual may be going through uh, that we couldn't if we're looking at one pathway at a time. Have you got any favorite herbs? Ooh, favorite <laughs> herbs. Mm. I, I will say that I absolutely adore sulforaphane. So this is a broccoli seed extract, and uh, it's often made a sulforaphane glucosinolate. Um, it is a, uh, it's a compound that turns on the NRF2 pathway in the body. NRF2 is a remarkable gene cassette that turns on the production of antioxidant enzymes. So instead of taking, quote, antioxidants like vitamin C or vitamin E, which have limited benefit, they have some benefit, but limited benefit. Here you're actually taking a compound into the body that is... Um, stimulates the body to make its own antioxidant. Now, there are many herbs that do this. There's many foods that do this. And here's something interesting that glucosinolates and sulforaphane have taught me, that stressed plants are much better at supporting stressed humans. So what I mean by that is that in a broccoli plant that is grown in an organic environment, where it has to deal with the stress of of, um, of heat, of, of sunlight stress, of insect stress, of wind stress, if it has to adapt and suffer somewhat, it's going to make more sulforaphane and glucosinolate. And flavonoids. Huh? And flavonoids, yeah. yes. It's going to make more protective compounds. And so eating foods that are organic, that have suffered a little bit, actually turn on our genes that help decrease the stressors that we experience biologically. I think it's gorgeously poetic, right? That, you know, when we're uh, eating closer to the land, uh, we're actually obtaining benefits far and above, not just getting pesticides, mm. not just getting herbicides. We're actually getting a higher food quality that can't be measured as this much vitamin or this much mineral. Yeah. It's really these magic molecules in the plant that happen to be created as a result of them trying to adapt to stress. You know, some of these molecules that are so great are actually the plant's own insecticides. And you know, who knew, you know, that, um, and that those would be so good for us. Yeah. Uh, and again, I think it causes us to be humbled that how arrogant we can become in our science just because we know one thing it distracts us from knowing the larger thing. And that's what I think is so uh, remarkable about functional integrative medicine is that we're challenged to always look at the bigger picture, to continue to question what do we know and say, how can we do better? Um, so much fun. 
Dr. David Hassey, thank you so much for leading us through that, how important it is to offer, firstly, dietary, a good dietary scape and certainly behavioural modification where appropriate, and at the last, a judicial and well-chosen supplements to lead somebody to better emotional, mental health. Um, so I just thank you so much for leading us through that. Thank you very much. It's been fabulous to be with you. This is FX Radio, and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook.